Element 43, otherwise known as technetium, has left scientists with numerous questions throughout the years in regards to its unusual natural radioactivity with such a small mass. With no known stable isotopes, technetium stands as one of the many mysteries of the chemical world. But is the element's radioactivity really a mystery? In a sense, yes, due to our lack of a full understanding of radioactivity itself. However, when we look deeper into the atomic structure of the element, we can produce a wholesome hypothesis. Following the few decades after Henry Becquerel discovered radioactivity, we only knew the simple truth that certain elements such as uranium released emanations with variable velocities and masses. Also, we soon discovered that radioactive materials could undergo spontaneous change, which suggests that the change occurs from within the atom itself. For the next century, scientists around the globe accumulated knowledge relating to atomic and nuclear structure, and we added numerous smaller, more fundamental particles to our arsenal. Almost 80 years after technetium's discovery, our enhanced knowledge on nuclear chemistry and particle physics can help unravel some of the element's secrets. But first, a quick debriefing on technetium's radioactivity. With such a small natural abundance, technetium became the first artificially produced element. First isolated by Emilio Segre and Carlo Perrier in 1937 by bombarding the molybdenum 98 with neutrons, with the element eventually decaying into technetium 99. Now, technetium half-lives can range anywhere from 4.2 million years to less than an hour, and oftentimes, technetium will undergo nuclear transmutation. For example, the metastable isotope of technetium-99 will eventually decay into the ground state of technetium-99 and then ruthenium-99 through beta and gamma emission. Now, from these few facts, we need to make our first conclusion. Technetium, seeing that it has no stable isotopes, means the element is always seeking a release of energy to become more stable. And because technetium either is forcefully created from or decays into molybdenum and ruthenium, we know those two elements are more stable than technetium. Lastly, a brief reminder is that atoms with odd numbers of protons or neutrons will typically be less stable than atoms with even numbers, which there are only four known isotopes of elements with odd numbers of both neutrons and protons that are actually stable. Now, moving into the nucleus. Speaking generally for all atoms, the nucleus, as we all know, consists of protons and neutrons. In order for the nucleus to be stable, there needs to be a balance of forces. The forces I speak of are the strong nuclear force between neutrons and protons and the electrostatic force between protons. In order to account for the electrostatic repulsion felt by the protons, the neutrons help to spread the protons out, creating a lesser repulsion. A lesser repulsion allows for the strong force to play its role. As mesons are exchanged between the close-knit nucleons, the strong force overcomes the present repulsion and the nucleus is held tightly together. From here we need to now state our second conclusion. Stable nuclei, as in a simple statics problem, have a net external force of zero, resulting in a nuclear equilibrium. Before moving even deeper into the nucleus, we need to make a third conclusion. When looking at the binding energy of technetium, or the energy needed to hold the nucleus together, the data follows the pattern which is suggested by the periodic table. Therefore, we can infer that the nuclear build of technetium is not necessarily an unusual phenomenon, but rather a normal structure. Now, within protons and neutrons exist what are known as quarks. Currently one of the most fundamental of all particles, two up quarks and one down quark make up the proton, while two down quarks and one up quark make up the neutron. But what exactly do quarks have to do with the instability of technetium? Quarks are contained within a confined area due to the color force, which has exchange particles known as gluons. The color force is the force between quarks, which directly translates into the strong force that exists between baryons or particles consisting of three quarks, aka protons and neutrons. So, with this last tidbit of information, we need to make our fourth and final conclusion before formulating an answer to our initial question. Within a stable nuclei, there exist fundamental particles that move about within a confined space that in turn are responsible for the strong force between nucleons. Alright, so let's bring all the pieces back together. We know technetium is constantly on the move to a more stable state, most times ending up as molybdenum or ruthenium. Also, we remember that odd numbers will bring out more instability generally. For the nucleus, we must have equilibrium of forces between nucleons. Third, we now know the binding energy of technetium does not wander far from the path, suggesting something else outside of unnatural tendencies. And lastly, more fundamental particles than protons and neutrons move about within the nucleus, and with movement of mass comes momentum. So then why is technetium a naturally radioactive substance with no known stable isotopes even though it has such little mass compared to the general trend of radioactivity? Well. We should start from the inside and move outward. Then we can throw in some analogies to make the presentation a little clearer. Let's look at the isotope technetium-98, which has the longest half-life. 
The atom consists of 43 protons and 55 neutrons. First off, two odd numbers, but we will shortly come back to that fact. For every neutron and proton, there are three quarks, with all the proton baryons having a plus one charge. That is 43 positively charged baryons moving about 55 neutrally charged baryons while all the quarks within the nucleons are experiencing some form of asymptotic freedom. So first thought, there are 98 triplets of quarks carrying momentum confined to a dense area while almost half of the nucleons have the same charge. As we move to the interaction from the perspective of the proton and neutron, we have 98 nucleons that, when close enough together, exert a strong nuclear force that must keep the 43 positively charged nucleons from submitting to the electrostatic repulsion. Adding one more step to our thought, as these nucleons carry momentum on more fundamental levels, they must now balance forces. In order to do so, the nucleons must arrange themselves in a plausible pattern to achieve their goal. Before we move further, I must add a quick note. Through observation, an ideal ratio of neutrons to protons would be 1.5 to 1, while this technetium isotope has a ratio of 1.28 to 1. Moving our reference frame one step farther out, we now have an array of technetium atoms that are all experiencing constructive wave interference between one another, while vibrating in a solid structure. As a final formulation of the thoughts presented, we have 55 neutral and 43 positively charged nucleons that must balance forces with an undesirable ratio of neutrons to protons while holding together through constructive wave interference, with the addition of a little vibration in the solid structure. Now in light of all this, I believe one valid hypothesis can be formulated. Technetium has a tendency to either decay out of existence or to another element through transmutation due to the simple fact that Mother Nature always strives toward the smallest potential. Although it may not be extremely difficult or unnatural to produce isotopes of technetium, it is unnatural for nature to not choose the path of less potential. Technetium decays into molybdenum and ruthenium due to the fact that they carry a more stable structure of nucleons within. So it seems that, in a way, technetium is the cause of its own natural radioactivity. The multiple factors presented accumulate into one large undesirable element in nature. Now, as a final note, I'll use one quick analogy to help us understand a little better. Imagine trying to fit a square into a circular hole with a side length just over the chord length, A. Even though we may be able to fit the square into the hole with a little applied pressure, it would be much easier to use a fitting circle. For technetium, it may just be easier to allow nature to decay the element to more fitting element. Although, as of right now, we may have a theoretical answer to our problem, I personally am intrigued by exactly how nuclear structure is set up. Why exactly can't 43 protons form a stable structure within a nucleus? That question makes you want to mess around with an atomic building set again. Well, on that note, our time is up. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any suggestions for videos, let me know. Thanks for watching and enjoy your lives.